It has been said that the first 11 chapters of the, of the book of Genesis are much like the broad strokes of an artist's brush as he prepares the canvas for the more gentle strokes and intricate strokes which will make the painting a masterpiece. Or that is like the orchestral overture that allows you to hear the theme of the songs that will come later when the curtain is raised. And then in chapter 12, the broad strokes are gone. And that is where God starts to lay out his plan for salvation. Oh, I'm sure that you probably think of salvation in the New Testament sense or in this Lenten season in the sense of the cross being the tool of salvation. But actually, God's plan for salvation started about a thousand years before that day. You see, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it lays out how God created the world and how due to sin, humanity was led down the road to chaos and destruction. But in chapter 12, God comes with his plan of salvation and history's lens is focused on those people that he chose to help him implement that plan. I was one of those people. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Why in the world would he have chose me? Well, believe me, I've asked myself that question a million times, and I still don't have an answer. But then why does God choose anyone? Why did he choose you? Why did he bring you here tonight to hear my story? He chooses because he is God, and it is his prerogative. It's our job to listen and hear, us, hear him when he calls. When God called me, I was known as Abram. My wife was Syrae. Our names would later be changed to Abraham and Sarah but I'm getting a little ahead of my story. There are those who say that God chose me because everyone around me was an idol worshiper, and I wasn't. I wish I could say that was true, but it's not. You see, if you're familiar with the book of Joshua, you would know that myself, along with my brother and my father, we all worshiped other gods. But the day God called me, I put all that behind me because from that day forward I knew that there was but one God. He didn't choose me because I was something special or a hero. I was far from hero material. Actually, I was kind of a coward and you'll see that throughout my story. My story isn't really my story even it's just a small part of history in God's story. Now there are those who say that all the Bible is based on the oath that God made to me. You see, God made a promise to us. It was actually a promise of blessings. God promised to give the land of Canaan to myself and my descendants. And I was to have many descendants, more than the grains of sand in the sea, so that they might go forward and be blessings to all nations on the earth. When I started my journey, I took only my wife, my nephew Lot, our possessions, 
and the servants which belonged to us. We left our home in Haran, which was in the far northeast corner of what you now know to be Israel, and we traveled south down toward Egypt. That's where the first stories of my cowardice show up. You see, my wife was a very beautiful woman, and I knew that Pharaoh would be taken by her. So I told her when Pharaoh's men came, tell them that I was her brother, not her husband. When they came, she did just that. They took her, but they spared my life. Later, Pharaoh's family and house would be riddled with disease. And when he figured out what was going on, he sent Sarah back to me and sent us on our way with a stern rebuke. Now we traveled from there to Negev, to a place called Bethel. It was then that I realized that Lot's herdsmen and my own were fighting amongst themselves. There was not enough grass and water for all our animals. So I called Lot to come to me and talk. I told him, choose the land that you want, and I will go the other direction. Of course, Lot chose the richer of the lands. But a bargain is a bargain. I took my wife and our things, and we left. Little did we know at the time that the land that Lot chose and most of his family would soon be wiped out. Oh, I could tell you stories about Lot and his family and the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah and how when God destroyed the land, he saved Lot and his wife and how she was turned to a pillar of salt when she disobeyed God's word. But I would be remiss if I left this place tonight without telling you about my son. You see, God had promised me heirs, and we had no children. By this time, my wife and I were quite seasoned. You see, we were almost 100 years old, in our 90s anyway. God kept promising us a child. We didn't know how it could happen. Why, my wife even told me I should take her servant girl, Hagar, and have a child with her. But that wasn't God's plan. One night we had a visitor from an angelic being that reiterated God's plan for us to have children. My wife overheard this conversation and burst into laughter. How in the world will I ever become pregnant when I'm over 90 years old? Well, you've heard the saying, God works in mysterious ways. He certainly does. It wasn't too long after that she became pregnant, and we had a child, a boy. We named him Isaac. In our language, it means laughter. Each time we looked into his face, we would see our doubt, and we would see God's blessing. Things were good after that. As Isaac grew, we became very close. We did most everything together. And then came the day that I wished I would never have been born. You see, God came to me and told me that I was to take my son and offer him as a sacrifice. I, I didn't understand how God could ask such a thing of me. After all the time we had waited for him to be born, Isaac was the child of the promise. Without him, there was no promise. I prayed to God over and over that he would change his mind. But no such luck. I went to Isaac and I told him he would accompany me to Mount Moriah for a sacrifice. He was excited. 
You see, he had gone with me on other sacrifices, but this was the first time we had traveled to Mount Moriah. So we left with some servants and made our way to the mountain. Now when we reached the mountain, I told the servants to stay behind. Isaac and I would go on ahead by ourselves. He had been full of energy and, and questions, but I think he could sense something was wrong. He kept asking me why I was so sullen. I just shook my head and dismissed it, said I had a lot on my mind. And then as we walked without the servants, he noticed that we were carrying wood, but we had no animal for sacrifice. He asked why, and I said, God will provide. Now, when we reached the spot where the sacrifice was to be made, we built the altar and we set the wood for the fire. It was then that I knelt down in front of him, took him to my chest and hugged him tightly, and then I told him what God wanted me to do. His face turned ghost white, and then the tears streamed down from his eyes, and I started to cry as well. I continued to pray. I prayed that God would change his mind and just, or wake me up from this dream, but he didn't. So I bound Isaac's hands and his feet, and I laid him on the altar. I held the knife in my hand. If only I was a little more courageous, I might have taken that knife and plunged it into my own chest, sacrificing myself. But I couldn't do it. I took the knife, looking down through the tears in my eyes, and raised it above my head. I was going to strike the blow that would kill my son. Just as I was about to bring the knife down, I heard a voice just as clear as my voice is to you tonight. It said, Abraham, stay your knife. Do not harm the boy. For now I know that you fear me, for you have not withheld your son from me. And then I heard a rustling in the brush beside us. I looked over and there was a ram caught in the thicket. What was it I had said to Isaac? God would provide? Indeed he had. So through the tears I pulled the bindings from his arms and from his feet. We went over, caught the ram, and we used it as a sacrifice instead. I could never understand why God had asked me to do such a thing. Even now, I think back, Isaac had, was haunted for a long time by nightmares of that day. And even though God had promised, it was still hard to think back. You see, it's only now, thousands of years later, that I begin to understand. You see, Mount Moriah would later be the place where the town of Jerusalem was built. It would also be the site of another sacrifice. Only this time it wouldn't be my son. It would be God's son. God's son would be sacrificed on the cross to atone for your sins and mine. Only a sacrifice such as that could wash away our sins. And here tonight, we come and we remember. Not only remember, but we receive the 
words that he said, this is my body, this is my blood given for you. Not only words, but truth, the only truth that matters.